Hey guys, welcome to today's uh, Friday afternoon reading. Uh, glad you could join us and uh, or join me, right? And uh, just to let you guys know, I'm in my new studio. You can see my awesome poster. I know I talked about it last week, but I love this poster with the planets. Um, interesting facts about the solar system. So uh, anyway, I'm a bit nerdy that way. So uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and continue with our reading. Uh, the book we've been reading, of course, Buried in Ice. It's the mystery of a lost Arctic expedition. Right? And we had been reading the story, um, and there were some deaths in the Arctic. So some of the sailors uh, have passed away, and they're not exactly sure why. So um, if you guys are able to catch my reading right now, that's awesome. If not, you can always catch it on my Sean Forstler Realtor wall on Facebook, or um, I'll be uploading it to my YouTube channel later. You can just Google Sean Forstler YouTube, and it'll pop up. So uh, anyway, so today's chat, we only have two chapters left. We have chapter six, chapter seven. Um, so today is chapter six, and the name of the chapter is called Unraveling the Mystery. Beachy Island, August 1984. So we have just trans, put, transported in time. So we had been talking about the actual time of the trip, which was in the 18, 1845 to 1846. So now suddenly we're at the same location, Beachy Island, but it's August 1984. So what's happening is the story part is, is come to a close. So right now what's happening is uh, back in 1984, this team of archaeologists go up to where that where those sol where those sailors passed away, and they're going to be exploring and finding out some more information about what really happened to this expedition. And I think you'll find it very interesting what what they find out. So <clears throat> this was back in 1984. I know that's a long time ago, but um, that was modern times at one point, 1984. So we will get started. Unraveling the mystery. Although I was anxious to begin excavating the graves of the three men who had died on Franklin's expedition during the early months of 1846, we had to set up camp first. Over the next two hours, we put up our large cooking tent and organized our field equipment and food supplies. We set up our sleeping tent some distance up the beach so that the food was between us and the bay. This was a necessary precaution considering that Beachy Island lies along a polar bear migration route. Polar bears coming out of the bay to snoop around our camp would discover our food a long way from us. We also put up an electrical alarm fence around the sleeping tents to warn us if a bear visited us while we were asleep. And we had rifles as a final protection against these powerful inquisitive animals. After our own tents were assembled, we put up an antenna and connected our radio. We would be in contact twice a day with the Canadian government base at Resolute Bay. Both the success and safety of our project depended on the radio, our only link with the outside world. How different this was, I thought, from Franklin's situation. No radio, no outside contact. Nobody knew where in the vast Arctic the ships were. No wonder it took so long to find any trace of the expedition. There was still a small stream running beside our camp, the same stream Franklin and his men had used 140 years earlier, and we scooped cold water from it for washing and cooking. Our food consisted of pasta, oatmeal, tinned and freeze-dried food, and a small amount of fresh fruit and vegetables. The warm, root, the warm rooms, soft beds, and good food of the government facilities in Resolute Bay seemed far away as we all zipped into our sleeping bags at the end of our first day. The numbing cold of the permafrost was just a few inches beneath our sleeping pads. So permafrost is the part is, is the ground that never thaws out. It's permafrost. We were planning to dig up the body of John Torrington first. We knew that Torrington had died early in the expedition and we wanted to find out why. It had taken an enormous amount of preparation to secure all the necessary permits from the authorities, as well as attempting to contact any known relatives of the dead men. Now, at last we had the permission we needed to open the grave and examine the body 
and none of us took the responsibility lightly. We only hoped that our work would be justified, that the knowledge we gained might, might then help explain the misery and death that had followed for the others. And we hoped above all that we might bring some light to a moment of history that had, for so long, been shrouded in mystery. Let me just show you all a couple pictures. Uh, yeah, these are photographs, of course, because 1984 they had cameras. So this is a, a picture I'll show you of the team members setting up their tents, and they had to store the food between them and the bay so the polar bears wouldn't get to it. But here's a photograph of them setting up their tent. And then here is a poster. All over the world, huge rewards were offered to anyone able to find or help Franklin and his men. So this was an actual sign that was posted around the world to find these guys. So that was posted over 100 years ago. Because they were never found until, until now. Well, until 1984. We weren't, of course, the first to search for Franklin and to try to unravel the mystery of the lost expedition. When the Erebus and the Terror did not return, no one was worried for a long time. The expedition had enough supplies to last for three years, and experienced Arctic explorers knew how easily a passage could become blocked by ice, which could add several months to a journey. Sir John Franklin was too seasoned a commander, his ships too sturdy and well-equipped for anything to go seriously wrong. Besides, England had already sent over 50 expeditions to the Arctic, and though they had suffered great hardship and some deaths, someone had always returned. But when Franklin was not heard from for three years, people in England started to get anxious. They were worried for his safety and the well-being of the crews, of course. But maybe even more than that, no one wanted to believe that something could have gone wrong. Everyone had heard about the gut-chilling Arctic cold and the forbidding icy landscape. They realized that a ship in trouble would probably be impossibly far from help. Yet people could simply not accept that the most well-supplied, well-planned, and well-commanded expedition of all time might have met with disaster. So for the next 10 years, more than 40 expeditions set out for the Arctic to search for Franklin. It's a lot, 40. A huge reward was offered to anyone who could bring back any news of him. Search parties began looking for Franklin in 1848, but it wasn't until 1850 that the three graves were discovered on the shore of Tiny Beachy Island, which is where our, our guys are now um, that just set up the tent there. Near the graves were stone rings where tents had been erected, the gravel foundations of a storehouse and carpenter's house, the remnants of a garden, a shooting gallery, several lookout platforms, and a neat pile of over 700 empty tin, empty tin cans. Evidence that Sir John had spent many months at Beachy Island. The searchers looked hopefully for a message telling where the ships were planning to sail, but found none. Why had three men died so early in the expedition? Where were Sir John and the other 125 men, and where were the Erebus and the Terror? Over the next few years, searchers began to look even harder. They set out from the search vessels in large sledging parties. They tied notes to hydrogen-filled balloons and released them in hopes that they would be carried by the wind to the missing sailors. They painted giant messages on the sides of cliffs and left stone caches with food, hoping that the lost men would find them. They even trapped foxes and put collars on them, which had messages attached in case one of Franklin's crew shot them. Still, nothing more was found, and the searchers sailed home where they were welcomed coolly by many disappointed relatives and friends of Franklin's crew. On January 20th, 1854, a notice appeared in a London newspaper announcing that unless the lost explorers were found by March, they would be listing as having died in the service of Queen Victoria. But then, on October 23rd, 1854, Dr. John Ray, an explorer who journeyed overland living like, like the Inuit, which were the Eskimos, met natives far south of the other search areas. These Inuit had several forks and spoons from the Franklin expedition, as well as one of Franklin's own medals. They told Ray that they had heard from other Inuit about 40 white men walking south. The men were pulling the ship's lifeboats mounted on sledges and had dragged them over King William Island until they dropped dead of starvation. 
Their ships, the Inuit had heard, had been crushed in the ice. Dr. Ray hurried to England to report his sad news, but he was not able to answer all the questions asked of him. He had not actually visited the scenes described to him by the Inuit, and many people doubted the accuracy of his reports. In 1857, Lady Jane Franklin hired Captain Francis Leopold McClintock to find out whether Ray's story was true. In 1859, on King William Island, McClintock met another group of Inuit who had many Franklin relics in their possessions, including silver cutlery and buttons. These people described finding a wrecked ship and told of seeing Englishmen who fell down and died as they walked. Finally, on the island's southern coast, McClintock found the evidence everyone had been looking for. On a beach ridge, he came across a bleached white human skeleton dressed in the shreds of a steward's uniform lying face down in the gravel. Close by lay a small, close by lay a small clothes brush and pocket comb. <clears throat> and farther north was a rock, car, rock cairn containing two notes written on a single piece of paper. The first note was dated May 28, 1847. It reported that the expedition had spent its first winter at Beachy Island and its second off the northwest coast of King William Island. But around the margin of the paper was a second message, written nearly a year later. It described how the Erebus and Terror had been trapped in ice off King William Island since September 12, 1846, and had been deserted on April 26, 1848, nearly three years after setting sail from England. Twenty-four men had died, including Sir John Franklin. The note added that, that the 105 survivors were planning to walk south in hopes of reaching the Back River. They could then row up the Island River system to the nearest fur trading fort. Wow. So they did find the evidence at the expedition that looks like no one made it. Um, so just a couple pictures I'll show. They found this metal... Uh, John Ray, who spoke with the Inuit, the natives of the area, this was one of the medals that they found on, the, with, that the Inuit had. And then here's a uh, painting of Lady Jane Franklin, uh, which is Sir, Sir John Franklin's wife. And these are just a couple paintings. And then here's a painting of Captain McClintock, who found out and verified all this grisly information. And then up here, let's see, that's just, uh, let's see. That's just the men discovering some of what they found on that, on that um, island. Clearly, the attempt to reach safety by land was a desperate move after the ships had been trapped in the ice for 19 months, as their food supplies dwindled. The journey to the river was one that none of the men would complete. Final proof that their march was doomed to failure was found along the coast south of, of the Cairn at a spot that was later known to be known as the Boat Place. There, McClintock came upon a lifeboat from one of Franklin's ships. The heavy boat was mounted on a sledge. Inside the boat, along with huge amounts of supplies that included everything from silk handkerchiefs, button polish, heavy cook stoves and religious books, to scented soap, curtain rods and toothbrushes, were two human skeletons. One appeared to have been disturbed by animals, but the other remained untouched, wrapped in cloth and fur, with feet tucked snugly into a pair of boots. Propped against the side of the lifeboat were two loaded guns as if ready to be shot at a polar bear or fired into the air to catch the attention of rescuers. But for Franklin's men, the rescue had come 11 years too late. McClintock returned to England with news of his discoveries, and after that, the public interest of the Franklin expedition died down. Still, the voyages of the dedicated explorers who searched for Franklin, many of whom also lost their lives in the Arctic, were not made in vain. Because of their efforts, much of the unknown north was explored and mapped. And by the time I made my first trip to the Arctic in 1981, we did know a great deal about the fate of Franklin's men and just how desperate their last days had been. 
I had examined the bones we found on King William Island in 1981, and as I was looking closely at a thigh bone, my attention had been captured by something unexpected. Many of the bones collected at Booth Point had marks on them made by the teeth of animals like the Arctic fox, but three of the marks on this thigh bone looked different. Using a high-powered hand lens, I closely examined the scratches. There was soon little doubt in my mind. These were not tooth marks left by animals. They were knife cut marks. I remember slouching back in my chair as the significance of this discovery sank in. The awful possibility of cannibalism among Franklin's dying men was first mentioned by the Inuit in the 1850s, but these reports were greeted with stunned disbelief in Britain. Yet the thigh bone I held in my hand seemed to prove that cannibalism had taken place during the last dark days of the expedition. My thoughts flashed back 136 years as I imagined Captain Crozier and Captain Fitzjames writing the famous note explaining that they were going to start on tomorrow for Back River. I pictured the survivors abandoning the familiarity of their ships in the still bitterly cold Arctic spring. Weak with hunger, but determined to return home, they dragged heavy sledges laden with boats full of unnecessary objects from the frozen wasteland toward a destination they would never reach. The icy winds would have cut through their thin woolen clothing as snow filled their cracked seamen boots. The crewmen's feet and hands would have become so sore with frostbite that they could only hobble along mile after frozen mile. Their courage must have flagged with each step. Some sailors probably gave up turning back towards the ships, and as McClintock discovered, others simply died in their tracks. How many, I wondered, became so desperate that they resorted to cannibalism? The tragic deaths of John Torrington, John Hartnell, and William Brain seemed almost fortunate compared to the last terrible days of these sailors who, one by one, froze to death. My disturbing discovery had only made me more anxious to solve the Franklin mystery. We knew when and where the expedition came to an end, but we did not yet know why. Would John Torrington's body be well enough preserved to provide the final clue to what happened in those last nightmarish months when the brave expedition went so wrong? So this is a painting of, uh, in 1848, Franklin's sailors made a desperate attempt to walk to safety. Starving and exhausted, they dragged their boats south until they could go no further. And so this is just a painting of what that may have looked like. You know, living in, uh, in the DC area and in, in DC, we, it's hard to imagine how cold it was but we don't really get temperatures as cold as it gets up there. I mean, they're just brutally cold. And one more thing to share. 11 years later, McClintock's party made a grisly discover, discovery at what came to be known as the boat place. And this is where they discovered the skeleton. It's right here. So, a really intense chapter, I know, and we've got one more to finish it up. Um, so, thank you for joining me today, and I hope everybody has an awesome weekend. I think the weather's supposed to be really nice. Hopefully, no more rain. So, see you all here next Friday. Bye.